and bring the best you kind of a master class webinar if you will first who am i uh, my name is ray binkowski i promote the unconditional pro qualifier ocb midwest states and unconditional pro qualifier ocb spring naturals i started promoting back in 2005 to date between the two contests I believe I've promoted 20 or 21 events. That's me emceeing one of our events. Um, I am a competitor. I'm a former fat guy that lost 60 pounds. I've written a few books. I owned a commercial health club, which I sold early in 2019. Things that matter to you guys, let's dig into the webinar. And again, if you have questions, by all means, ask them. We're happy to to answer them, you don't have to wait till the end. Time, uh, probably the first thing you need to decide if you're going to do a contest, whether it's bikini figure, bodybuilding, physique, whatever it might be, is you need to start looking at the calendar, decide what event is going to fit your schedule, and then is that event going to allow you enough time to get ready so that you're comfortable, you're confident, to bring the best you to stage. What I can tell you we're seeing in our events is in conversation with competitors that win, they are allowing themselves 20 to 24 weeks of prep. Now there's certainly some individuals that spend 12 to 16 weeks and they do fine, but for the most part in conversations with winners, they tend to spend uh, five or six months during the year getting ready prep, pre-contest, whatever you want to call it. So take a look at the calendar, find the event, and start laying out your contest prep and make sure that you allow yourself enough time to get ready. Also keep in mind that if you're new to competing or you're a first-time competitor, it's easy to get discouraged and compare yourself to somebody that maybe has been competing and training for five years, eight years, or 10 years. It's kind of that 10-year overnight success. Uh, make sure that not only do you allow yourself enough time to prep for a specific event, but also be fair and realistic to yourself and understand and accept that it does indeed take time to build an appreciable amount of muscle mass, get lean, and then also stay lean. Um, there are no overnight successes. It does take time. And especially in the drug-free side of physique contests, there's really no way to skip that time piece, like you have to put in the time, both in your prep, 20 or 24 weeks, and then also amount of time that you've built muscle, maintained muscle, and stayed relatively lean. Great place to find events is gonna be ocbonline.com. That's our OCB organization website. They list all of the events. You can go on there, take a look at what events are offered when. So again, back to that calendar, so you can have that 20 or 24 weeks if needed for prep. And then also see what events are close to your home. So you're not traveling across the country. Uh, OCBonline.com, take a look at the schedule. This is our next event right here, Spring Naturals. It's April 18th, 2020 in DeKalb, Illinois. It is an OCB unconditional pro qualifier. Uh, but again, you need to figure out, you know, where are the events and when are they? Look at the calendar, make sure you can allow yourself enough time to get ready. For the drug-free side of the sport, in regards to the OCB, our events are 100% drug tested. So it creates a level playing field. Uh, barring any further discussion, drugs, not no drugs, uh, legal, illegal, uh, whatever. At, at the end of the day, for the OCB, for our events, it's 100% urine drug tested. So it creates the most level playing field we can. So it removes the opportunity for somebody to potentially have an unfair advantage. Now, once you've picked that event and you've looked at the calendar, if you're going to do a drug tested event like the OCB offers, you need to go to OCB online and familiarize yourself and review the banned substance list. If you're going to compete in another organization and they do drug testing, same thing. Find the organization's website, take a look at the banned substance list, and make sure that you haven't inadvertently taken products that are banned. It, it, we, in our 15 years of promoting events, 
at almost every event, there's one individual that is ineligible to compete. Uh, more often than not, it is they took something that's on the banned substance list that may not be an illegal substance. Uh, we do have the occasional individual that's trying to beat the system. Uh, they were taking uh, drugs knowingly and they're trying to beat the system, but we do have individuals that end up ineligible simply because they were taking things they didn't realize were on the bad substance list. So whether it's the OCB or any organization, if it's gonna be drug tested, make sure you jump on the organization website, take a look at what the banned substances are and make sure you're not taking them. And in some cases, individuals that we've had to tell were ineligible to compete, uh, they didn't start taking a particular product that was banned until they were during prep. So with a little bit of early education, they could have avoided taking that product and been able to compete. Um, types of pro qualifiers, I'm going to cover this only because it's come up in questions um, for our events, the Midwest States and Spring Naturals. Our events are unconditional pro qualifiers, which basically means we are going to award the pro cards. We don't have to check a bunch of boxes for minimum number of entries and minimum number of competitors in a specific category. Um, if an event is a conditional pro qualifier, there's gonna be some minimums in terms of entries and competitors that have to be satisfied to offer the pro cards. Uh, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on that, but that question has come up, so I thought there was value in including it. Categories. Now we're going to be talking about bikini, but before we do that, and before you enter a bikini contest, you need to make sure that your physique lends itself to bikini. You're going to want to go again to the organization website, ocbonline.com. And if you're doing another organization's website, go to theirs, review the guidelines for bikini and make sure that by entering bikini, you're in the right spot. You don't want to enter bikini when according to the organization bet guidelines in your current physique, you might have been more competitive in figure. So it, again, it's definitely worth taking the time, go to the organization website, take a look at what the requirements are for bikini and make sure that's the right spot for you. We've had competitors in your pa years past enter a bikini when they should have been in figure, not place well or at all, and be very disappointed. In the case of the female that entered bikini and belonged in figure, uh, one particular case, she was shredded. She really should have been in figure, um, way too much muscle, way too lean for bikini. So again, spend that time early on, familiarize yourself with what the guidelines are for the organization you're gonna compete in, and make sure that what you enter is the right spot for you. And I've got some comparisons for that. For bikini, this is a common bikini look. When we look at coaching competitors, uh, prepping competitors for contests, if they're female and they're asking about bikini or figure, bikini has more of a straight up and down look. Uh, lean looks good in a two-piece bathing suit, athletic, whereas figure, and we're gonna see that in a minute, is going to have broader shoulders, wider shoulders, a more narrow appearing waist, and it's almost like an hour, hourglass figure. So there's a lot more curves to the figure competitor. And if you tend to be more curvy, there's a big drop from your shoulders to your waist, you're probably going to do better in figure, and you want, want to take a look at that. Um, for bikini, these are, these are the um, facings or the poses. There's gonna be a front facing, then a half turn, and then a rear. So that's pretty much it. So bikini, there's only, it's half turns, it's not quarter turns like figure and bodybuilding and physique, or classic physique, it's, it's gonna be half turn. So a front facing and a rear facing. And now we're gonna compare this a little bit to figure. Here's that broad shoulder, a big drop from shoulder width to the waist. Slightly different pose for both of the, the front facing for figure. Um, and again, you can see, and this is really gonna highlight it, individuals that tend to do better or will do better in figure are going to have kind of that big drop. Now, obviously this competitor is a lot leaner, but there's a significant drop from the circumference or the width of the shoulders to the waist. Then it gets larger at the glutes 
narrower at the knees, whereas the bikini, it's more of a straight line. You don't have a bunch of lat development, not nearly as lean. So if you look like this, you belong in figure. If you look like this, you belong in bikini. Um, same thing, we've had women that, you know, look like a bikini competitor enter figure and they don't place well, if at all. And it's just a matter of they didn't enter the right category. So there's a lot of value and benefit going to that organization website, the event you're gonna compete in, if it's drug tested, familiarize yourself with the banned substance list, and then take a look at what the organization rules and guidelines are and make sure that you are going to enter and prep for the right category. So you guys should be able to see that difference. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty pronounced. Divisions. This is an opportunity when we look at divisions. Uh, when you enter a contest, you've already, you know, you, you've read the guidelines, you belong in bikini, that's what you're gonna enter. Always enter everything you're eligible for. It's kind of like you prep once and compete numerous times. So you go through the diet, the training, all of the hard work on the front end one time, and you get to get on stage more than once. So we don't offer debut at our contest. We offer novice, the open, and then masters. I just cherry pick some stuff to give you guys an example. But if, for example, you've never competed before, you have, and you've never won first place, you should enter novice. Um, you should also enter open. So just because we see a lot of first time competitors scared to death to enter the, the open, you only wanna do the novice. Well, really you should enter both. You've got nothing to lose, you've done all the work and you never know and I can tell you from experience, it's just happened at our last contest. We promote the OCB Midwest States. We had two first time competitors win overalls and one of them did it in the open. So always enter everything you're eligible for. If you're over the age of 40, Masters is 40 and up. For the OCB that we promote with, I would say enter the novice, enter the open, and go ahead and enter that age specific or Masters category. Prep once, compete more than once. It's a no brainer. You're already there, you've already done the, the hard work. Go ahead and enter the other uh, divisions also. The more you get on stage the day of the contest, the more relaxed you are, and it's gonna improve your stage presence. It's gonna improve how confident you look, and it, in all likelihood, that's gonna to contribute to you moving up in the placings the, the latter times you're on stage. So if you go on novice first, nervous, or masters first, and you're nervous, novice, you're not as nervous, you start looking better, open, you're not really nervous at all anymore, butterflies are gone, you'll start looking a lot better on stage. So again, prep once, diet once, go through all the pre-contest stuff, compete more than once, improve your stage presence in doing so. Um, all right, we're gonna change gears. Even female competitors, we're gonna talk more about bringing the right package to the stage now. Um, and this would include removing body hair. Even though female competitors don't tend to have as much body hair as men, you still need to shave all of your body hair off that's not covered by your suit. Uh, even if you're fair-skinned and you have very light hair or blonde hair or white hair or gray hair, uh, you still want to get, even if they're fine, you want to get rid of that hair because on stage, under the stage lights with oil, the oil is going to find those hairs and they're going to show up. Um, we recommend a good quality razor, uh, shaving cream or sh shaving gel, start early, get rid of all of the body hair that's not covered by the suit. And for the most part, unless you have a history using chemical hair removal products, I would not wait until the week before a contest to try something like Nair. If you have a bad reaction with your skin or you get a chemical burn, it's something that could impact how you look the day of the contest. So we always tell competitors, don't, if you've never done this, pre-contest, peak week is not the time to mess around with the chemical hair remover. So you gotta get rid of all the body hair. The next thing, I've got a couple of slides are gonna show this. 
Competitor's tan looks good. She's got a nice contest tan. She looks dark under the actual stage lights. Um, you'll notice we can see definition up midway of the hamstrings. And we can see definition in kind of a nice sheen or a shine through, you know, through the back, the lats, the low back. But when we get to the glutes and we get here, especially right here, everything goes flat. And it's not, you know, that this line from the hamstring would probably continue up as with this one, but there's no oil here. So keep that in mind. You want oil all the way up to your suit line. Okay. Now that being said, a lot of contests are going to have expediters or a company or a team of people providing tanning, including your oil. They're probably not going to apply oil here. So you're going to have to do that yourself. And this is true for the men. It's true for the women competitors. And you, this is a great picture. You can see there were some lines in these hamstrings. But right here, we go to a flat finish almost. And those lines are gone. And it's simply because the oil is not there. So make sure that don't expect the expediters to do it. They're not going to. Don't expect the team that's providing the tanning service to take care of this part. They're not going to. You're going to have to do that yourself. And again, same deal, you know, this competitor looks great. You can see a lot of definition, her back, her triceps, calves, into her hamstrings. And then we get here and it's that flat finish. We get here, it's that flat finish. Um, we get almost here, flat finish, flat finish. And that flat finish where there's no oil, it will have an impact in regards to whether or not you look toned and defined on stage. So. Again, you can't rely on the expediters or the team that's providing the tanning service to do that. You're probably going to have to do that yourself. So be aware of that. The next one, um, I cherry picked a men's picture. I get this is a bikini webinar, but I picked this one for a reason because this is the best recent example I have by photograph of what happens when you have contest tan, contest tan, contest tan, contest tan went to his local salon and got airbrushed. If you're going to do the contest, you don't want to be the person that doesn't have the right tan. And unfortunately, most salons, and we used to work with a local salon and send competitors there like 15 years ago. Um, they had an air, air or sunless uh, airbrush booth, but the solution that salons use, it's not the same as the contest solutions. You won't be as dark and when you get on stage, it's going to be very noticeable. And ironically, this, this competitor inquired about tanning with us, signed up, and then changed his mind and said he was going to go to a local salon. And we, we suggested he may not want to do that because one of these would not look like the other ones because it's not the same sol solution. Even though the salon swore it would be no different, Obviously, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's different. So make sure you are going to have to be tan. With air, contest airbrush tanning today, you don't have to spend 30 days in a tanning bed. You really don't. You can be pasty white, very fair skin, and get airbrushed as long as it's a true contest solution. Along with the contest tanning, no matter who's providing the tanning service, they're going to give you a recommendation of what to do, typically seven to 10 days out. And then after you got your base coat or foundation, you, you have to follow the recommendations. We've had competitors completely disregard this and it impacts their tan the day of the contest. Um, less of an issue for women, but we've had male competitors wait to shave their legs and their body for the first time until the morning of the day before the contest. So shower for three hours while they shave, then go get their spray tan. It doesn't work out that well. You, you will be provided some guidelines and suggestions for that seven days out, follow them. It's gonna make a difference. You've spent the time and the effort to get in great shape. Don't, don't allow not following these recommendations to compromise how you look on show day. This one's a no-brainer. Like, it, there's no effort to smile. It doesn't make prep harder. 
longer or anything else, but it definitely, definitely ups your stage presence. So when you're on stage, smile. It's going to do a lot for how you look in the eyes of the judges. Um, we call this the contest secret. Smiling on stage improves your stage presence. So smile. I mean, it's a gimme. It's free. It's no cost. It's zero effort. And, you know, this competitor looks like a million bucks simply because she's smiling. You got to smile. Again, there's no extra effort. It's priceless. It's easy. Make sure you smile on stage. It's not just your physique that's getting scored by the judges. That's the first part. But when competitors are close, the judges are going to start to look for other things. And a lot of times, close physiques, one, one competitor may present better just because they look confident. They have great stage presence. They're going to end up being awarded a better placing than somebody who's not smiling, looks scared to death, and terribly uncomfortable on stage. Um, this is actually a figure group from one of our recent contests. I picked it because I wanted you to see what happens when competitors are not moving themselves into the best light on stage. So now these are call outs. The judges, obviously, it looks like they've split the group. They brought one group front center stage, but there's no reason that these other competitors that are back here, kind of in the shadows, could not have taken and stepped eight to 12 inches further and put themselves in the good light. So you want, always want to be aware of where that good light is on stage. This is another great example. You see what's going on here? You can't even see this competitor. So if, if you go out on stage, especially initially before the judges have had a chance to break the competitors into groups, do first, second, third call, call outs, whatever it may be. If you're off in the corner, Be the boss, step up, be the alpha, get these other competitors to slide over and give you some room. Or if they're not going to move to their right, if they're not going to move this way, step up here and get out of the shadows. Like you've got to know where the good light is and you got to know where the bad light is. And you definitely, if you're in the dark like this, you definitely got to step up and, and take charge and get yourself out of those shadows. Now we're going to talk a little bit about bikini and the required poses um, for the OCB. And I'm cherry picking the OCB because that's the organization I promote through. Again, go to the organization website for the contest you're going to do. Familiarize yourself with their guidelines. OCB bikini is half turn. So a front pose, quarter or a half turn to the right, a back pose. Now, their judges are going to be looking for symmetry, fullness, balance, shape, proportion, a good posture, poise, confidence, and stage presence. And again, that poise, confidence, and stage presence, no extra effort. All you got to do is smile. The other thing is we tell competitors, like, you can't just spend your pre-contest or your contest prep time training and eating. You've got to invest some time in posing. Why? Because again, the judges are going to be looking at your poise, confidence, and stage presence. And one of the easiest ways to improve those things is to practice. And we tell competitors treat posing like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 12 or 16 weeks out from a contest, if not further, we tell our competitors three times a day, start practicing the half turns. The other thing is, if you're totally unaccustomed to wearing shoes with a heel buy shoes with a heel or if you have some and you just never wear them start wearing them around the house and get comfortable walking in heels now you don't have to go and buy a contest shoe a platform contest shoe with a five or six inch heel you can use a three or four inch heel but whatever you buy make sure that you are comfortable and you can move around and you don't look like a robot uh, we had a competitor we worked with years ago. Um, she went and bought 
a much higher heel than what we'd seen her walk in pose, practice posing in. And when she came out on stage, she looked like a robot. The, she was totally unaccustomed to wearing the shoes. The heel was much higher than what she was used to, and it showed. Again, that impacts that uh, poise, confidence, and presence. The other thing is your suit needs to fit right. Hair and makeup need to be done, and it, it needs to be more of a, a stage makeup. The lights are very bright on stage, so it can't just be a faint makeup. It's probably going to be a little heavier makeup than what you would normally wear. Um, again, that matters. Bikini competitors you don't need to have deep muscle separation. You don't need muscle striations. You basically don't need to be shredded, and you don't need a ton of muscle size. Again, that's not bikini. So if you show up, you're very lean. There's muscle separation, some striations, and you're, you're, you have a lot of muscle mass. You probably belong in figure, and as such, you entered the wrong category. You probably will not place well. But again, I can't stress this enough. Go read those guidelines for the category you're entering for the organization you're going to compete with. Stage walks. Stage walk for the OCB, so the T-walk, the posing routine, the free posing routine, whatever you want to call it, it's not judged or scored. For the two events I promote every year, we've made the stage walk optional. We've done that because it, it's not scored, so it doesn't matter. It's not going to impact how well you do or do not plays. Now, some events and some, organization, some organizations may score it. I'm not sure if anybody still does. I think the ones that used to score it no longer do. Again, double check that. But then also keep in mind if there's a best poser award or things of that nature, um, it may be based off of or the stage walk, T walk posing routine may contribute to that score. So, you know, onus is on you. Do your homework and make sure you understand um, what value there is in doing the stage walk, if any. Now, along with that, for bikini, most bikini competitors simply do a T walk. And both of these diagrams, for the most part, ignoring the numbers, represent the letter T. So if you entered from the left, position one, position two, three, four, five, and back off. Or if you're entering from the right, you would enter stage center, front and center facing the audience, three, four, back to the center for five, six and off. This isn't written in stone. You can do this however you want. And again, most organizations aren't gonna score it anyways. I put it in here because a lot of people ask, where do I start or what should I do? That's pretty much it. Sometimes the judges will ask you to do something for fun. Uh, it lightens the mood makes it a little more fun. Here's a bunch of bikini competitors doing a double bicep. I'm including this with a couple of lion's heads because you need to be the boss. You gotta be the alpha. And, and that applies for whether or not a group of competitors bunch close together or you're stuck off to the side in the shadows. You can see this competitor right here, Lindsay, she's moved a little bit forward. So she's in front of these competitors. Don't be afraid to do that. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be unsportsmanlike. Um, but you def there's nothing wrong with kind of being assertive and you've worked hard to build your physique. Get out front and show it. Make sure the judges can see it. Same thing here. These competitors are bunched way too close together. There's nothing wrong with having people move over or stepping a little bit further. Um, uh, Michelle asked for the T-Walk, should you pose? at each of the positions for the T-Walk. Again, it's totally up to you. Uh, most of the organizations don't give a lot of guidance or requirements on that. What we tell competitors is show the best you. So do whatever shows the best, best you at each of the positions of the T-Walk. Does that make sense? If not, post another question. Um, so again, you wanna be the alpha. Move yourself forward, spread out, show off, you know, the physique you put a lot of effort into building. This group's a little bit more spread out. 
some of the same competitors, but I think this works a lot better. Don't be afraid to have the competitor to your left and right, ask them to take a step over, give everybody a little bit of room and show the best you, be the alpha. Next, we're gonna talk about suits. And yes, Michelle, absolutely. For the T walk or the stage walk posing routine, you can be as creative as you want. The one thing we'll recommend with the routines, and we don't allow it at all at our shows, um, but I tell competitors, don't try and do any like floor gymnastics stuff, no cartwheels, no handstands, no flips, no handsprings, simply because you don't wanna get hurt and you wanna slip and fall. So beyond that, get as creative as you want. In regards to suits, you could break the bank buying a suit. You don't need to. Um, find something reasonably priced. There's nothing wrong with looking at a used one. You can go on Facebook. There's some uh, groups that trade and buy used suits. But what I will tell you is a must. A lot of the suits, the bling, the bedazzle, the decorative stuff, make sure that this isn't just plastic chain mail. If it's just plastic with tiny threads going from stone to stone, you're going to want to have your local seamstress or tailor behind that put in some elastic. You won't even see it, but if this plastic were to break, it's going to prevent you from having a wardrobe malfunction. Um, we used to do that all the time. When I owned my club, I had a, a trainer and an employee that was, could also, I wouldn't say she's a seamstress, but she was good at doing that we would have her do that for competitor suits all the time. So with suits, don't break the bank. If you're getting something really cool that's blinged out, make sure that there's something behind those plastic pieces. And it's not just tiny plastic beads that have been chrome plated or look like a diamond with a tiny piece of thread through it. Uh, the next thing, suit placement. You want the hip string of the suit bottom to ride at your iliac crest. So the top of your hip bone, uh, top of your hip bone, okay? Not flat across the waist. What happens is when it's up high, up high, it's gonna make the leg look longer and leaner. When we wear it wider, it makes our midsection look wider, our legs look shorter and fatter. So the suit should be worn high up the hip around the iliac crest, which is the top of the hip bone. Same deal. Like, look how much different this competitor's legs look versus this one. And it's just moving the strap over the waist, up the hip to the iliac crest, high on the waist, would change how that competitor looks. Again, that's a no extra effort in contest prep. It's just adjusting your suit. And again, this is a stage shot. You can see the legs look longer and leaner when the actual waistband, this one can actually go up a little higher, is worn higher up the hip versus that one. Another example. Good, good, should be a little higher two straight across the hips should be higher. It makes a difference. Now, these are two images of two groups on stage, bikini competitors. When we look at bikini, from a training standpoint, you need to invest a lot of time developing your glutes and hamstrings. And this kind of, photo like this kind of tells a great story. A lot of competitors look great from the front. And some of these competitors are in this picture and they're showing up here. From the back, it's all gonna come down to glutes and hamstrings. And again, you can see where the oil stop, you can see where the oil stop, you can see where the oil stop, where the oil stop. Make sure that you have your oil all the way up your hamstrings to the glutes up to about the suit line. Don't expect the expediters to do it. They're not going to. And then from a training standpoint, you've got to invest time training glutes, glutes and hamstrings. You've got to make it a priority. All competitors are going to look great if they've done their homework, they've gotten lean, 
from the front. And when they turn around, that's when you can start going first place, second place, third place, fourth, fifth, sixth, so on and so forth from a judging standpoint. Um, I cherry pick some of our programs, you know, great posterior chain. So low back erectors, glutes and hamstring exercises, barbell hip thruster, straight leg, Romanian style deadlift, the back squat, just below parallel, uh, step down lunges, uh, glute kickbacks on a Smith machine, kettlebell uh, side goblet position, side lunges. I just cherry pick some training programs. Again, back squats. A, a lot of these movements or exercises are great for the glutes. You need to make sure that you incorporate them in training. You do it early and you're doing it with a significant load. Um, even at 25 reps, our clients are challenging themselves in the back squat. It shouldn't be something that you can do a bazillion times. It, you actually have to be training with enough weight. So the load has to be intense enough. Some more great exercises, uh, glute kickbacks, cable hip extension, all great stuff for training the glutes, hamstrings, posterior chain exercises. You got to do that early and throughout the entire prep. Because again, when we look at bikini competitors, and this would be true for figure as well, and it'd even be true for men's bodybuilding, everybody's going to look great from the front. It's when the competitors turn around and they're facing that curtain, doing the rear facing, that you can really start taking the competitors apart and start placing top three and bottom three. Make the investment in that posterior chain, erector glute hamstring training. Do it early. Uh, leverage social media. Uh, it's, you know, 2020 when we're doing this live, it would have been true in 2017. It'll be true in 2023. The platform might change, but leverage social media to build a community to keep you motivated, inspired, and keep you moving along. You know, jump on Instagram, follow other people that are competing, make some friends, follow events. OCB Midwest States is our Instagram page. Um, get out there and use social media to your advantage. Attend an event. Um, we don't see it often, but we do see competitors that have never seen a contest themselves, yet they're stepping on stage. Uh, you can certainly do that. We've had plenty of people do it. But that being said, if there is a contest in your market or within a reasonable amount of time to travel to by car, jump in the car and check out the event. It's going to help you be a lot more comfortable on stage after having seen an event than to show up the day of and not have a clue as to what's going on. So get out there and see an event. Um, volunteer. This is a, a group of our last uh, judges as well as three trial judges. So get, you know, get involved. That has to be a part of an event. In trial judging, even for a seasoned competitor, if you've competed five, six, seven times and you've not judged, you've not trial judge, trial judge is going to give you a pretty powerful perspective from the judges table that is going to allow you to be a better competitor next time you're on stage. I think it's a, you know, it's a great tool for somebody to be a better competitor. Just asking the trial judge, every organization allows it. Um, there's, there's no cost. And typically you end up getting a free ticket into the event. So you can, see the event and get out there and, and trial judge as well. So volunteer in a, in a great place to do that is ask the trial judge, especially for the seasoned competitors. A great learning opportunity. Um, day of, this is our itinerary from the last Midwest States in November. Uh, you're gonna get this from your promoter. At least they should provide you with a day of itinerary. Uh, make sure, again, you've reviewed the banned substance list if it's a drug-free event before you do the drug test, ideally before you start prep so you don't inadvertently do something during prep you shouldn't have. Um, but beware of what the time frame is in the order of events. And being aware of this and reading it, you know, checking your emails so that when you get something from the promoter, you've read it, it's going to make you more comfortable the day of. You're, you're going to know what's going on when. 
So make sure you spend the time. If you're given the itinerary by email or what have you, review it. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. We, can, we encourage our competitors to ask all the questions they want. The more questions you ask, the better the experience you're going to have, the more comfortable you're going to be. Um, there's no bad questions. And I think most promoters would, would agree and say, if you have questions, ask them. Again, the order of, of events, the contest starts at noon. Who's going on first? Men's physique, Masters Novice Open. We keep that constant. So bikini would go last. So you're, if we start at noon, bikini's probably not getting on stage to between eh, maybe 2, 2.30. But read the emails. I get this every contest. Hey, I don't know where to go. Hey, what time do we have to be here? What's the address for this? Everything was sent to you. It's all in an email and there's a PDF attachment. Everything's laid out. All you gotta do is open your email. Um, so make sure, and sometimes they go to trash or whatnot, but if you haven't gotten something, reach out to the promoter and ask. Um, but if they're sending it to you, make sure you read it, familiarize yourself, get comfortable. It's going to make your experience a lot easier, less stressful, and it's going to contribute to that poise, confidence, and stage presence. If you're going to do a drug tested event, make sure you understand what that means, what the organization's bad substance list and requirements for the drug test. Um, we, we have competitors say, well, I did a urine test six months ago for this event. Can you use that in place of my polygraph? The answer is no, everybody's got to do the polygraph unless you've been polygraphed within six weeks of, our, of that event. So make sure you understand what the organization requirements are, what any timelines are, uh, what products you're not allowed to take, things of that nature. There are different organizations have different requirements. So you definitely want to familiarize yourself with the organization you're going to compete in's rules and regulations. And do that early. Don't wait until a week before the contest. We've had that where a week before an event, people call and they're like, hey, I took this. Can I still compete? Well, the answer is no. So do it early. Do it early. Um, coaching. It's probably one of the biggest questions we get. Do you have to have a coach? No. Um, is it required? No. Does it mean you'll do better? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, what coaching does do, it holds clients accountable. Even an average coach or trainer, what you're buying or paying for is, is some accountability. And there's, there's no question there's value in that. And even cherry picking some of our, our clients. This is what it looks like when somebody is being accountable with their nutrition, it's total calories. And this is what it looks like when somebody's eating whatever they want, whenever they want, and then not even bother to log food. So from a coaching standpoint, what are you most likely to get? You're most likely to get some bare minimum, some accountability. At the higher end, you're gonna get knowledge. You're gonna get that coach's experience. When you're nervous, they're gonna talk you off the ledge. Um, from a training standpoint, they're going to know what to change to, when, and why, and it's going to make sure that you're continuing to make progress as your event nears. But bare minimum, it's, you're going to eat this way, hitting your targets instead of whatever's going on here. We, after our last webinar, we got asked, so we created something for this one. You should have already gotten an email from us. If you're interested in coaching, we took – Coaching, good coaching is expensive. We took 20 weeks of what we've done or similar, to, similar approach to what we do with most bikini competitors. We built out five months of programming, workout, cardio, posing, calories, carbs, protein, fat, everything. We put it all into our training app. So if that's something you want, it's half off. Promo code, I think it's 2020. I'll send it by email again when the webinar is over. You can click the link and get that. It'll give you five months, of everything you need to do to get on stage and be comfortable and confident. Um, even it's, if you're watching this live, it's January. It'd be a great program to look phenomenal by mid, late May, just in time for summer, swimming, beach, bathing suit, whatever. But because we got asked a bunch after our last webinar, we said, you know what, we're going to go ahead and build something. We'll make it available. So, there it is. You'll have a link. Uh, OCB Pro Contest. If you earn a pro card with an OCB event, 
you have the opportunity to go on and compete as an OCD pro. In 2020, first and foremost, the women, so bikini competitors earn as much money as the men at the pro level. A lot of the organizations, and I have no idea why, because there are more bikini competitors in an event than there are men's physique, men's bodybuilding, or whatever. Bikinis, for the last few years, has been the largest draw in terms of competitors and spectators. Uh, but the OCB is paying out the same amount of money to men and women. So the men don't make more, the women don't make more. First place pays out first place dollars. And that's 2,500 bucks. Uh, for the Yorton Cup next year, the first place payout, again, male or female, 7,500. And all the OCB dollars for wins at pro shows are contingency free. So if we say first place gets 2,500 bucks, if you win first place, you get 2,500 male or female. There's no fine print that says we needed 1,000 entries. There's no fine print that says there had to be 29 bikini entries. And since there are only 28, we're not awarding the money. Uh, the OCB pro organization has the money and if somebody wins, they're getting their money after they pass the drug test, of course. Um, but that's worth noting. Not all organizations are like that. Make sure if, you, if and or when you earn your pro card, if you go on to compete as a pro, make sure you're aware of what the organization's regulations are on that. Because a lot of times competitors are surprised that they won a pro contest, but the event didn't satisfy the number of entries and the number of entrants, say, in bikini to award uh, the financial prizes. Um, so you definitely want to be aware of that. This is where I shamelessly ask you to follow me at Eat by Color. It's the title of my first book. Definitely follow the OCB event pages. The fastest way to hear what's going on at our events from a promoter standpoint is to follow our pages. It goes to, typically goes to Instagram first, Facebook after that, and at some point it might go out in an email blast. So if you want to stay on top of what's going on and you want the information as soon as it's available, the best place to go is go over to Instagram and follow. The other thing is we've got a movement called the Project Strong. Uh, we're trying to use great stories of transformation and inspire other individuals to take the first step and change their life. If you've got a great story of transformation, we'd love to hear it. Uh, you can email me. Uh, you can message me. We'd be happy to share and feature it if you're selected on the Project Strong website and then also on Instagram at Project Strong. This is where we turn it over to you. Who has questions? I'll hang out and answer all the questions you guys want. If nobody is asking any questions, I'll stick around for a little while and then we'll probably end the webinar. But if you've got questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. And remember, there are no bad questions. The more you ask, the better prepared you will be the next time you get on stage. Does anybody have any questions? How do you uh, qualify to be eligible to compete in the pros? You have to win an OCB pro qualifying event, in which case you would um, take a urine test immediately. And then upon completion successfully of the urine test, which will take a week or two weeks, uh, you'll be awarded your OCB pro status, which then allows you to go on and compete at the OCB pro level. That's a good question. We should probably work that into the slide on some of the pro information. Who else has something? Can I? Yes, Michelle, what do you got? Anybody got anything else? Happy to answer and stick around as long as you guys have questions.
Again, thanks for uh, thanks for checking out the webinar. We appreciate your time today. We appreciate those of you that have, have asked some questions. Raise your hand. Um, without the competitors, we don't have events. Michelle's got a question. Are there multiple height classes for bikini? We kind of took that out of this webinar. We've covered it in the past. For the OCB, we split, and it, it is somewhat at promoter's discretion. For my events, we split by height. And we typically won't start splitting bikini, for example, into bikini one, bikini two, bikini A, bikini B, or bikini short, bikini tall. We are going to split by height, but we won't start making that split until we get 12 or 13 competitors entered. And the reason for that is it is a contest. We're not looking to give everybody a trophy. There's no participation trophies. And we also, you know, we, we have to balance that along with not having, you know, seven people that are five foot five and then in bikini one and then two people that are over that height in bikini two. Do competitors need to bring anything? That's a good question. Um, probably one that we need to address. Typically what we tell competitors we work with that we prep for contests you're going to want to bring comfortable, loose fit clothing, some water, a little bit of salt or Gatorade, something to snack on. Uh, we like Snickers because they've got carbs, fat, and some sodium. Most events are going to provide an area backstage. Our theater actually has a full theater dressing room in the basement. So there's makeup lights and, and areas to do hair, to do makeup. We have a dedicated area that oil can be applied on. And then over the years, we brought a lot of dumbbells and a bench. The last few years, the dumbbells and bench are getting used very little as many competitors are bringing their own exercise bands and tubing. And the competitors are using their exercise bands and tubing to pump up before going on stage. Things I would not bring to the backstage, I wouldn't bring my purse. I wouldn't bring my wallet. I wouldn't bring valuables. Like I would leave that locked in my car or with friends and family, significant other, or what have you. I don't think there's any reason to have that stuff backstage. Uh, Michelle asks, in order to earn your pro card, you would need to win your class and then the overall. Correct, Michelle. So in the case of, let's say we have Bikini 1 and Bikini 2. The first place winner of Bikini 1 would compete against the first place winner of bikini two for the overall in the event that there's just bikini open. So, there, and that's something too. Pro cards only awarded to open and masters. They're not awarded to debut or novice. Um, if there's only one group of bikini open competitors, the competitor that wins first place in the open also earns her pro card because by default, she's also the overall winner. Good questions. Um, some of them we have not gotten in the past and some of them are gonna be information we'll work into future webinars. So your questions also benefit us because they allow us to provide a better webinar for other competitors, even if it's gonna be for other categories like figure or, or bodybuilding, but good stuff. Any more questions? Our next event is Saturday, April 18th in DeKalb, Illinois. It is an unconditional pro qualifier. Um, how do you determine how dark to go with tanning? Uh, typically the tanning staff, if you're getting your tan at the contest from the partners of the event that do true contest tanning, um, bikini doesn't need to be dark, 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 like bodybuilding. Um, but you don't want to be too light and look like in the slide that I showed where everybody on stage clearly got a contest tan and one individual went to his local salon. Um, but typically if, if the staff that's providing the tanning service has experience, they're going to know how dark you need to be. The other thing is most contest solutions, the base or the foundation is, apply, is applied by airbrush on Friday 
that actually gets darker with time. So a lot of times we get, you know, competitors will get sprayed and be like, well, I'm not even that dark. And it's like, well, in four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, you're going to be much darker. Then part two for that contest tan is going to be an actual bronze top coat applied the day of. Um, and those two are going to make you pretty dark. And if a competitor still isn't dark enough complected, they might get a, a second or a rarely, but it does happen, a, a third top coat the day of the contest. Um, another question, what, how should you dress for check-in? You, you want to dress comfortable. Uh, we tell our, our competitors we work with, keep their warm-up, you know, wear warm-ups, loose fitting. Keep them on until you actually are getting ready to go out on stage. So if you're going to pump up, leave your warm-up stuff on, pump up, then go out on stage. One thing that to be aware of, though, if you're getting a spray tan or even if you're applying your own tanning product, you don't want to wear socks and tight shoes because it's going to rub the tanning off on your feet. And it will make your feet look a lot lighter and um, brighter on stage relative to the rest of your physique. So typically, really loose-fitting shoes, uh, no socks. If it's warmer weather or it's a warm client, you know, summer sandals, flip-flops, thongs, thongs, whatever, something like that. So you're not taking the tanning off. Um, but yeah, you want to dress comfortably to go to check-in. What else you guys got? You bet, Michelle. Thanks for attending. If you got more questions, ask them. I'll, I'll seriously sit here and answer all you guys have. I see a couple of you still hanging out. You guys have more questions, more stuff you want to learn or probably the only thing we haven't covered that's worth mentioning is it's you against you on stage. It's really hard. Physique contests are, are subjective. It, it's hard to plan, to work hard, give 100%, show up and be guaranteed a class win or an overall win. It just doesn't work that way. You never know who's going to show up. You never know what their condition is going to be. And some things are outside of your control. So it's, it's always best to compare you versus you every day a little bit better than you were yesterday. And if it's your second contest, your goal should be to do better and look better as an individual than you did at your prior one. Uh, spectators, and I'll speak to our events, our events run straight through. Um, traditionally, and this is not how we currently, currently run either the Midwest States or Spring Naturals. But traditionally, and we used to do this, we don't anymore. Traditionally, there'd be prejudging in the morning. So at 11 a.m. or noon, there would be prejudging. That would end around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. There'd be a break until 6 or 7 at night. And then there'd be the finals and awards. We don't do that anymore. We start at noon. We do what used to be called prejudging. We'll take an intermission. 15 to 30 minutes, depending on what judges and staff need. We'll bring competitors out after intermission in order by competitor number to do their stage walk or posing routine. We'll take a five minute intermission. We'll bring top five out for awards. One ticket gets access to the entire contest. Traditionally, we don't do this anymore, but traditionally competitors, friends, family, significant others, coworkers, they would have to buy a prejudging ticket and a finals ticket. So for our events, it's one ticket. And yes, you can get up and leave the auditorium. So if you have little kids and the girls need to get up, stretch your legs, get out of the auditorium, um, 
whoever is, is watching them in the audience can simply get up and walk out. You can come and go as often as you want. There's no issue with that. And for our events, I think it's age 12 and under don't need a ticket. When they, if you buy tickets online, you still have to buy one. You enter their, their age and it changes the ticket price to zero because it's assigned seating and we want the kids to sit with the parents or whoever they're going with, but uh, they don't even have to buy a ticket. But no, they, they do not, once they enter the auditorium, they're not stuck. They can go back and forth as often as they want. We changed the big break midday because it quite honestly didn't make sense. And, and your question, Michelle, about your kids is exactly why it didn't make sense is we didn't want, you know, the friends and family of competitors hanging out in DeKalb, Illinois any longer than they had to. They want to see their friend or family member get on stage. They want to see them hopefully get a trophy and then everybody wants to go out and eat. They don't want to sit for hours on end in an auditorium. But no, it's, it's one ticket for the entire day and uh, spectators can come and go out of the auditorium as often as they like. No issue with that. And I think that's probably true for most events. I don't think there's any issue with that. Anybody else have questions? Would you guys prefer these webinars on the weekends? Does anybody have any feedback on that? They'd be willing to share. Weekend or after four. All right, we'll keep that in mind. Ironically, they say the best time to do a live webinar is between 11 a.m. and one or two on a Thursday. That's why we've been doing Thursdays, but if weekends work better, it doesn't matter to me. I'm happy to do it whenever it works best for you guys. And if we don't have it, there are more questions, I'll answer them. If we don't have any more questions, I'll probably start shutting the webinar down. Does anybody have anything else? I think most of you have left. There's only a couple left. All right. Well, we'll end it there. If you've got questions, by all means, shoot me an email. Happy to answer them for you. Uh, good luck with your first time or 10th time on stage. Thanks for joining us for the webinar. Hope you found it useful and informative and hope that it contributes to you bringing a better you to stage.